Again, as Charles said, I'm Dennis Winkler, COO of Winkler Public Relations, and I have the honor to moderate the uh, refining panel this afternoon. I will introduce the, uh, the speakers, and then I'll tee up some questions, but let me remind you that uh, we're using the Slido app. Uh, we've been doing it effectively, and I hope I can keep that trend going. So send in your questions, and we will be sure to uh, feed those into the, uh, the panel discussion as well. All right, let me introduce the three guests, and I'll tell you that uh, first we have uh, Tim Sutherland. Tim, go ahead and raise your hand so everybody knows uh, you are. Uh, Tim is the general manager of Chevron Pasadena Refinery. After earning a bachelor's and master's degree at the University of California, Davis, Tim joined Chevron in 1991. He's had a number of engineering and management positions at several of the Chevron's locations. It's important to note that Tim served as the integration manager during Chevron's purchase of the Pasadena refinery. He brings 30 years experience to his new role and he's the only member of the refinery leadership team to have worked in all five of Chevron owned and operated facilities. He loves anything outdoors, hunting, hiking, skiing. You have to leave town to go skiing, so I know you're not doing that here. Uh, those of us who have been around a while uh, are familiar with the Pasadena Refinery. We've known it by several other company names. Tim, I'll tell you that we're thrilled Chevron is now the owner-operator of that facility. Everybody will be excited to hear from you why Chevron added the refinery and what the plans are for the future. Second, we have uh, Brooke Vickery. Brooke, raise your hand if you would. Uh, Brooke is Vice President and Refining Manager of Flint Hill Resources. He's based in Corpus Christi and oversees marine terminals and refineries with a refining capacity of more than 320,000 barrels per day in the coastal bend. Uh, Brooke has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Oklahoma State, an MBA from Iowa, and holds a professional engineering license in control systems. Flint Hills is evolving as a company, and I'm sure we'll gain some insights uh, about Flint Hills from, from Brooke. Third, all the way to my left, your right, is uh, Greg Neverman. Uh, Greg is site manager for Lyondell Bazell, Houston Refinery, and he's also director of refining products and planning. He joined Lyondell Bazell in 1996, has served in many roles in the company's manufacturing, commercial, and planning groups. He's a native of Wisconsin. Uh, he earned a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Wisconsin. Madison. And on the Lion Del Bazell chemical side of the house, we've seen a lot of expansions and new plants. It'll be interesting to hear Greg's comments about growth in the refining sector. I'm going to uh, take my seat in a moment and join them for the panel discussion, but I'm going to tee up a question for all of them that I think you will be interested in. I would like to ask each of them to take an opportunity to tell us about, tell you, a little bit about their company, the people, the plants, and products, but perhaps end with some specifics about the facilities they're currently managing. Gentlemen. So I work for Chevron, obviously, and uh, we're the second, I think the first maybe right there, we're the first uh, or the second largest uh, U.S. integrated oil company. We've got, uh, we operate in over 100 countries in the United States, or in the world. We have 48,000 employees in our company, and, and I'll get more into the refining part of it. We own, we wholly own five refineries in the United States. So two on the West Coast, uh, El Segundo in Southern California, Richmond, Northern California, Salt Lake, and then again, getting closer to, to here now, Pascagoula Refinery in uh, Mississippi. So. Why did we buy Pasadena? I guess that's probably an appropriate uh, question. So I believe Pasadena is going to be 100 years old next year. I think it's had at least three owners, and, uh, and we know that. Uh, we obviously did our due diligence. But there were, uh, so May 1st, we took possession of that facility, so we've only been there 120 days or so at this point. But there's really three reasons, and sorry, it's a 100,000 barrel a day unit, not particularly complex, uh, but it does run uh, all West Texas crudes. So th there's really three reasons. Um, we're short of product in this market. We, uh, we buy from some of you friendly people uh, to, fill our, to fill our gasoline. So one is let's go ahead and produce our own, our own products. The second is uh, 
and we've, I think we're pretty successful on the West Coast integrating our manufacturing facilities. So we really will plan, uh, we'll plan our oils movements or crude movements across both facilities in, in California as an example. And so we intend to do as much of that as we can here. Again, Pasadena is 100,000 barrels and Pascagoula is 300, over 300. So we're a little bit mismatched, but we've already successfully uh, traded intermediates back and forth between the facilities. Um, and the last one is really the strategic part is we've got, we have big holdings in the Permian. And so our, our, forecast, our production forecast out of the Permian is uh, gonna increase. And so we wanted some uh, direct control over, over those crude barrels. So again, uh, Pasadena runs West Texas crude, crudes now and, and, uh, uh, and, it, and it will in the future too, but it's gonna run Chevron crudes. And then last is just the location. Uh, I mean, you, I think you all know that, right? I mean, uh, the pipelines, the Kinder Terminals, uh, neighbors, it's, uh, I mean, it's right in the middle of everything. And so um, location, 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 as they say. So it, at the end of it, right, we're really interested in this area to be all the way from the crew directly to the customer. And, and uh, um, anyways, that's, that's the strategy. So a little bit about the future. I think the part that's real clear to me is again we're gonna we're gonna monetize Chevron crudes in that facility. So we've we've got a couple projects under well one specific project underway to uh, uh, realize that. So we can run West Texas crudes now. We have already uh, well, actually equity crudes, but we intend to increase that. So it's going to take some investment. I'd say probably modest investment. We will continue to look at the configuration of the facility too to make sure that we. Uh, just match that to our market shorts. And we'll, we're also gonna take a look at our product slates. Um, I'll just say mostly in the, in the motor fuels space, um, I, meaning I don't think we're gonna turn it into a chemicals facility. Um, you know, and then we've got a fair amount of land on the site that's unused or that there's an old paper mill on the site if you're familiar with it. And so we really have not studied that in any detail, but it does give us an opportunity to uh, uh, expand uh, it gives us some flexibility. So again, for, for sure, some work in the crude space and our crude unit, but then beyond that, not, nothing, uh, nothing concrete at this point. Brooke? Okay, I'm uh, Brooke Vickery. I'm the plant manager at the Corpus Christi refineries, and uh, I'm on my third year as a plant manager. I spent many of my years at the Minnesota refinery just south of St. Paul, Minnesota. It's called the Pine Bend Refinery. Flint Hills owns two refineries, and those are the two. Um, the refineries there in Corpus are configured to run uh, up to 100% domestic crude, mostly Eagle Ford, uh, Permian, looking forward to some more Permian from uh, you guys over there. So, um, and we have, uh, over the past three years, done quite a bit of work to reconfigure to get the refinery ready to run the light suite uh, crude coming from Texas. And so that's a major portion of our strategy. We also uh, have an integrated chemical facility, so we make paraxylene, metaxylene, um, <clears throat> and uh, some other chemicals, and, uh, and then make your uh, diesel, jet fuel, gasoline, most, mostly for the central corridor of Texas, San Antonio, Waco, Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, hello, I'm Greg Neverman. I work for Lion Delta Cell. So Lion Delta Cell is one of the world's largest polymer and uh, uh, plastics companies in the world and petrochemical companies in the world. Uh, we employ over 19,000 people, which I thought we were pretty big until we talked about Chevron. Uh, obviously, you guys got us beat by a little bit. Uh, we make a lot of products, uh, but we're global leaders in polymer compounds and fuel ethers. So fuel ethers is our additives to transportation fuels that reduce the emissions in our vehicles. Uh, so the I work at the uh, Houston refinery, and the refinery was built in 1918 on the Houston Ship Channel, which makes us one of the oldest operating facilities on the Houston Ship Channel. So over the years, obviously, things have changed drastically. Uh, today, we're capable of processing 268,000 barrels of heavy sour crude, which is differential to the philosophies that Chevron's taking in their Pasadena refinery and Flint Hills is taking in their corpus. We're, we're bringing in a lot of Canadian crudes and South American crudes primarily. 
we do try to supplement with some West Texas intermediate and sour crudes. It's just not a great fit for our facility configuration. Uh, we make quite a few different products, but primarily we focus on gasoline and diesel fuel. We make about 120,000 barrels a day of each of those products, which is the equivalent of about 5 million barrels. So to kind of summarize, Lyondell Bissell, we're a very large petrochemical company that happens to own a refinery here on the ship channel. Thank you. And I just want to remind the audience, again, if you have questions you would like to have asked, please just use the uh, slido.com app and we'll, we'll get to your questions. All three of you mentioned uh, significant refining presence. We have always heard that about 25% of the U.S. refining market is served out of this region. Is that still a reliable number or has that changed as supply and demand has changed? <laughs> okay, so that's, that's still, still a consistent. Yeah, I, I believe that's pretty consistent. I mean, the, the, the U.S. Gulf Coast, I mean, the, the U.S. over the last several years has gone from a net importer of finished transportation fuels to actually a net exporter. And that includes, you know, when you add gasoline and diesel fuel together, we actually are a net exporter. And a lot of those exports are from the Houston Gulf Coast. Okay, so we, we are actually exporting some of our refined products. Absolutely. To, uh, globally, correct? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, Roger, that addresses our theme, what we make here uh, changes the world, correct? No, thank you. Um, Greg, let me uh, ask, I, again, you're in, in a unique situation, refining manager within what I consider a chemical company. Yes. Um, I consider that too. <laughs> Lion Del Bazell has made significant expansion, obviously, in, in the ethylene plastics business. What are the challenges or advantages to you and your facility? being in that situation. Okay. I mean, obviously refining and petrochemical plants make very different products, but we actually have quite a few synergies. We have an Olefins unit or Olefins plant over in our Channel View facility, and even though they're about 10 miles uh, as the crow flies away from us, we are interconnected with pipelines. So the refinery provides feedstocks to our Olefins unit, and then the olefins units provide hydrogen, which we utilize to produce clean fuels in the refining, re refining process. And they also send us a lot of gasoline blending components that we utilize to make finished gasoline. So there's quite a few synergies between the sites. And in fact, that's kind of a business model for a lot of the majors is they'll build a refinery and a petrochemical complex together because they do complement each other so well. Uh, some of the other advantages of having one refinery in a petrochemical plant or having a refining business in a petrochemical company is both of our businesses tend to be cyclical. And we've seen in the past where when the petrochemical side of the business is kind of in a trough, a lot of times the refining industry will be in an upward swing and it just kind of helps level out our profit generation from a company standpoint. Uh, now there are some disadvantages. I mean, I wish I had four other refineries to integrate with uh, because, you know, the synergies I get from my petrochemical plant, I'd like to get some of those same synergies with other refineries. We do produce intermediates, and when we have units that aren't processing at full rates or are actually shut down, instead of bringing those intermediates to another one of our sites, we have to sell them on the open market, which is usually a downgrade from processing them ourselves. So we lose that ability. And you can also coordinate your turnarounds and outages better where you can actually be synergistic with other plants as well. So we miss out on that aspect. The other key issue that we miss out on is we, we, we don't learn from the other plants within our system. So if a problem occurs in a different refinery, like a company like Chevron or Valero is going to figure out what happened and apply it across all their plants. And we can tap into some of that knowledge by utilizing consultants, but we just don't have as much history inside our facility as someone like Chevron could tap into. So those are some of the, the downsides of having one. The, the other is around investment too. Uh, it's a, as a petrochemical company, you know, capital dollars to expand, the petrochemical side gets the primary focus on those dollars and we're kind of a secondary. So we get plenty of money for the HSC requirements and reliability but we tend to be second in line to get capital growth type dollars. Well, all three of you have mentioned capital growth and investments so far. 
And I guess that's interesting because the first question that pops up, uh, Tim, is a question for you. Uh, when do you believe the Chevron refinery would be fully functional, and what capital investment will it take? Remember, we have a lot of contractors out there who want to do business with us. <laughs> so I don't know if I really want to answer that question. Um, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we've got a, prog a, pro a project that's progressing. It's not fully funded yet, but I, I think that the economics of it look pretty well. And again, it's strategically connected. So um, the next few years, I mean, it'll be in the shorter term versus the, uh, the longer term. And I'm definitely not going to talk about the capital investment. And let, let me just remind the audience, uh, <laughs> Tim did warn us it's only been 141 days, yeah. right? So. Uh, uh, let me, uh, let me give you uh, what I hope is a little bit easier one, uh, Tim. First off, tell us a little bit about what it is, what it's like to actually acquire a refinery, and more importantly, share some background on how you are merging into, into the Pasadena community with that purchase. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we've bought some companies and, and we've merged with some companies, but I think this is the first time we've actually just bought a standalone refinery. And so... We uh, a little bit of background. We kept all the employees except I think there were three expats. Obviously, the refinery manager got changed out, but uh, so we kept that whole workforce. So that I think it, it's been really interesting because when you talk about a simple conversation like about reliability engineer, and and that when when I hear that I've got a context that I bring with me for 28 years, but. You know, two weeks later after I hire a new one of those, I figured out I hired the wrong kind of person, actually, because I didn't have the right context. So I think the first part is the language is very different. The acronyms are different. So it takes a little while just to kind of get on that same. Uh, but it, anyways, it's the language to get on the same uh, context and playing field. You know, the second thing is, is you talked a little bit about Chevron processes. Um, I, I've spent a lot of my time keeping Chevron from loving us to death. Um, you know, our medical folks have called, our travel people, our global security people, and you can imagine at this point of my journey, I'm more worried about understanding the mechanical integrity issues and the, and the environmental issues in that facility. So, um, again, our strengths can be a detractor at some point, too, and so I'm having to respectfully hold back the masses in Chevron. You know, we, Again, it's a blessing in disguise. We have 3,000 or 8,000 employees in downtown Houston, eight, uh, 13 miles away, but they all want to come help. And so we've, we've only got a 300-person workforce, so it's, uh, uh, but, but it, it's, it's good. We've chose to, uh, one of the first things we implemented at the facility is what we call our tenets of operations. And I think every, all the, all the companies have something, the golden rules or whatever the different things are called, but they're basically just 10 principles about, you know, running with safeguards, following procedures for high risk issues, you know, don't, don't uh, uh, contaminate your dedicated systems. I'm sure you guys have stuff like that. But they have two, there's two overarching principles about do it safe or not at all, and there's always time to do it right. So we've done the same thing. We put the posters up and talked about it and cascaded it down, but we've actually uh, had the unfortunate opportunity to walk the talk a few times and actually shut units down and leave units down to, to uh, in my opinion, address the repairs appropriately. So that's been pretty impactful to the employees uh, at this point. And again, it's unfortunate, but, but uh, again, we knew what we were buying. Um, you know, and then last, it's just having a good, strong business planning process uh, around, uh, with Chevron anyway, it's got to be safe, it's got to be reliable, and then ultimately profitable. And so we're big in the safe and reliable space right now. That's the top, top priorities for us. Um, you know, one, to make absolutely sure that we, we got the initial assessment right out of the data room, uh, but then also address the highest uh, potentials first. So I think that's a... Uh, so, Tim, you have heard the expression, we're from corporate and we're here to help you. Is that correct? Yeah, I got help last week, I think. <laughs> I think it was help. Uh, thank you. We have another uh, question uh, coming from, from our audience, and uh, I'll throw this, uh, Brooke, your way or, or perhaps Greg. Uh, the question is around digital strategy in your facilities, and I'm going to try to interpret mm -hmm. what that means. But I'm assuming that's 
in your ongoing maintenance or operation using artificial intelligence or virtual reality? Yeah, <laughs> I'll speak to that some. Uh, I, I think that's probably one of the major changes. I mean, I, I've been uh, with uh, Flint Hills. Flint Hills is a wholly owned subsidiary of Coke Industries back when it was Coke Refining Company since 1991. And if I just think back about uh, my career, I think right now we're seeing probably the major, the, the most major change in terms of digitization really driven by the price of technology has dropped like a rock. And in our facility, we're fully Wi-Fi uh, throughout the plant. All of our operators have mobile devices. All of our maintenance people have mobile devices. And the ability to communicate uh, and access information is, is astounding. Uh, what's going on there? The other piece that I think is really important is once you get to a, a Wi-Fi backbone, bone, I'll call it, uh, you can rapidly adopt wireless sensors, and that rapidly adopting wireless sensors is really going to change the game with regard to uh, improving the performance of our plants. You know, I think about, you know, my, my car's got lane departure warnings and uh, auto um, cruise control, adaptive cruise control, uh, airbags, I mean, all kinds of things that weren't there 10 years ago, enabled by the cheapening of technology. And, and I think that'll happen for the process industries as well. We're going to see a future of a, a much um, uh, better performing, uh, uh, more reliable um, operating facilities as a result of, of both having the right culture, but also being able to incorporate and adapt the new technology. Greg and Tim, anything to add to that? What do you see coming? I'm pretty much going to mirror, mirror uh, what Brooke said here. I mean, we're a little bit behind. Uh, we haven't fully implemented our digital strategy, but we see a lot of potential in getting that technology out into the hands of our craftsmen and, and our operators out in the field. And just having that information available is going to make them more efficient and I think be more effective and in, in safely and reliably operating our facility. So we're very excited about it, and we're moving down that path as we speak. Tim, it's a similar answer. Well, let me uh, raise, raise the question that I think this is begging, and I don't want to get into great detail because Jim Griffin's going to lead a wonderful workforce development uh, panel tomorrow. But what's the, what's the impact on, you know, on the workforce when you start moving toward virtual reality or artificial intelligence and use, using the digital platforms? Uh, you know, the biggest thing is particularly the workforce of, that we have um, that is, uh, well, let's say, the first 10 years of their career is the comments I get back from everybody is you don't even have to train them. You, you give them the iPhone and you show them how to download the apps and they, boom, learn from each other and adapt. I, you know, the other day I was talking to a guy and, and he was uh, talking about how he was an operator and he was checking to make sure that we had the right gaskets and a flange on top of a tower and he's up on top of the tower and uh, he had a question about it and he was with the maintenance guy, they, they pull out their iPhone, they're able to access the technical drawings for this particular flange and confirm the gaskets were the right gaskets without having to come down out the tower. So it's going to have a major impact. Um, I, I just say the, the workforce loves that kind of access to information and the ability to communicate with their, with their fellow workers as well. And we're seeing some of that, like on the craft side especially, in that, you know, we're having trouble as an industry attracting good talent into the maintenance craft type functions. And I've talked to some of our contract companies that we work with, and they're, they're seeing the same thing. When they start talking about, hey, I, I, we need boiler makers, which means you turn wrenches and you put, in, you, you put together flanges. They, you lose the interest of today's workforce, but when you start talking about automation, like we have automatic hydro blasting for tube bundles, then all of a sudden they're getting a lot more interest. So they're doing the same kind of work, but they're doing it from a technology standpoint, and they're able to attract, in their opinion, more people into the business, which we obviously need at this point. So, yeah, I, think, I think people, especially similar, right, the new people we get are, are kind of like, wow, you are... You're behind the time. So they're, they're, I think they're a little shocked when they come in and see, especially the people right out of college at this point, yeah. Very good. Well, I think uh, all of you know uh, personally, and we've heard a couple of panels already mentioned uh, today about incidents in industry. So I want to give each of you an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, emergency response 
and how you are prepared to deal with an event should it happen at your facility. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can go first. I mean, so, you know, we have a, a full-time emergency response chief on the site and a, and a deputy. Uh, we don't have a full-time uh, firefighting force on site. We use the operators, but I can tell you that it's, I see that every day in the turnover that we've got uh, adequate staffing for that. My view is they're, in fact, they're at A&M this week training. Uh, they're rotating through. So I see a lot of pride in our volunteer force and, and I see a, a goodly amount of capability. Uh, I'm a little new in the job to understand the entire uh, emergency response. I, I believe we subscribe to um, common response off the, off the ship channel. So um, that, that's, that's mostly it at this point. I, I, uh, the event that happened down the street a couple months ago, I just saw a little bit of information on that. So I think that's gonna, the lessons learned from that should be forthcoming to us and we'll take the appropriate action once we understand the, understand the facts. Um. Yeah, at uh, Corpus Christi, we keep um, uh, on-site uh, fire response capability and then we have uh, we're combined with the, down in Corpus Christi, the RTFC or return, Refinery Terminal Fire Company uh, that can bring forth uh, quite a bit of resources as well as from a response perspective. Um, I think the other thing is, that's important is we're, the, most of the plants down there are uh, engaged in a reverse alert system for community awareness. We do combined drills with the local community and, and uh, planning facilities. Um, have good relationships with all the emergency responders. Similar, uh, we have um, uh, operators that are trained as ERT as well that, that can respond. So they, I think it's a combination of all those things that are important. I mean, focusing on uh, good mechanical integrity and keeping the refinery safe to operate, but you also have to have, you know, a combined response capability, both community and your own uh, capability as well to, to make sure everything is done as you know as as expected to be safe and compliant, do things well. Yeah, and we're we're set up similarly. We have a, a full time fire chief, and then the rest of our emergency response team is volunteer, made up of operators, maintenance, uh, and other staff within the facility. They go through extensive training. I mean, Texas A and M has got a, a world class facility that they actually do fight industrial fires in a training scenario. So they they have some of the best training available that that we can give our our guys. We're also part of SEMA, which is the, the Channel Industries Mutual Aid uh, Association. We actually have some staff members on SEMA. We do uh, drills with them uh, periodically, and obviously we took part with SEMA in, in the event uh, at the terminal earlier this year. Uh, so very good staff. Um, you know, we also have paramedic staff, and you know, I've I've heard it said multiple times is you know having a, a bad illness is never good, but if you're going to get sick, get sick at the refinery because our emergency response team is going to be there and help you out. Yeah. Well, I think you answered uh, one of the questions that came from the often uh, the audience asking how do uh, how do uh, refineries work together in incidents, and obviously it's the mutual aid associations, but more than that, you're actually training with them in advance. Is that is that correct? That's correct. All right. And how, how frequently do you have uh, combined drills? I, I know it's at least once a year. I don't know the exact number. Yeah. Are any of your facilities actually bringing in some of the municipal fire departments and providing them training as well? I, I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not sure. I don't think so, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we cooperate with the municipal fire department from, uh, and, and honestly, they're pretty helpful from coming out if there's any uh, monitor combined monitoring or anything like that uh, but typically you want the uh, refinery terminal fire company that's trained to fight process fires engaged in in those kind of things yeah okay just a couple minutes left so I'm going to end with uh, what I hope will be a short answer uh, on, a, on a, a somewhat tough question refining we're hearing that we have alternative fuels we have electric vehicles is that disrupting supply and demand in any way that you have to be concerned about the refining industry going forward? Okay, so to start with, so here on the Gulf Coast, uh, the refineries that are, are built here are some of the most complex in the world, which means we can take the lowest cost, most difficult feeds and turn them into high value products better than just about any system in the world. So we're very, very competitive on a global uh, basis. 
We've also got access to low cost energy. Natural gas prices are, are, are really low compared to the rest of the world here, and we got a, a first class workforce. So, you know, we're positioned to be very, very competitive on a global standpoint here on the, on the U.S. Gulf Coast. Yeah, all those things are happening. You've got electric vehicles, um, you've got all kinds of new technologies, and at some point it's going to start having, in my opinion, an impact on, on demand, right? But that's not forecast to be for quite a while. There's still a lot of cars on the roads. A lot of the, a lot of the growth in, in demand is really in your third world countries and third world economies. So that's where we still expect to see the growth continue. And it's going to be muted by some of the new technologies and especially energy efficiency. The CAFE standards are probably one of the biggest impacts to the overall demand, especially here in the United States. But we just feel that's gonna slow the growth for a period of time before ultimately getting the peak oil or peak gasoline which I'm not really equipped to answer that. But for the near term, we feel like demand growth is still going to be there. It will start to get muted by some of these new technologies, and especially, like I said, the CAFE standards right. and the efficiencies that we're seeing. Brooke, Tim, anything to add, add to that? Yeah, I'll reflect on uh, uh, much of what Greg said, with, particularly with uh, focusing on being competitive. You know, all of us produce a product that we want to provide for our customers that enable um, mobility. And so, uh, you know, any, any product that enables mobility, you know, we want to all to come into the marketplace and compete. And so uh, I think that's fair, and so we want to do our best at competing, and we're in a really good spot in the Gulf Coast. Yeah, I think our view is the same. Good. Well, hey, I want to uh, ask the audience to show their appreciation to you for being candid with us and sharing your insights. Thank you very much.